it all along. Um, so I'm really uh, thrilled to be here and especially to welcome Wendy to her new um, to her new incarnation and look forward to collaborating with her. We've already, we've already begun that, uh, that process and unfortunately the work is not finished enough to show today, but next year, <laughs> next conference. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know um, who we are, um, the Center for Spatial Research is a hub for urban research at Columbia that links design, architecture, urbanism, the humanities and data science. We focus on data literacy um, as well as interrogating the world of big data, which we heard a lot about this morning, working to open up the invisible narratives about cities and tell stories about their chronic spatial conditions, abstracted and patterned as well as local and grounded. Within the time constraint today and Who's doing the timing? You, okay. Um, I'll focus on a few projects which tie some themes together around unjust infrastructures. Unlike many at this conference, um, I work through making collaborative projects around methods of spatial research. Put simply, it means that we make a lot of maps and data visualizations. Hosted within an architecture and design school, we theorize and write about through making images. This means we think about digital technologies critically and also understand them as creative technologies. We inhabit the, tec the technologies that we deploy, sometimes in not such great ways, I, I, I admit. Um, yesterday, we heard someone say, water, oxygen, Facebook. I understood this as a provocation, and I won't go so far as to fa equate Facebook with water, but I will say that data has become a resource. And like some other infrastructures that are contaminated by industrialization, or as we heard this morning, settler colonialism, um, data has never been a clean resource. We've heard many times as well yesterday that the internet utopias have by now died a predictable death. My own work has followed the complex military origins of its many technological developments, um, not only the internet, but I've always tried to reclaim these technologies for their inadvertent consequences and to ex expose their political biases and limits. And so the work we do at CSR simply continues in this new era of so-called data dystopia, perfect continuation. I'll show a few recent moments which address the theme of unjust infrastructures and show a few mapping interventions which elaborate upon and respond to some of these constraints. Um, okay, so I'm going to start here. Um, so is there sound? Can you hear anything? Yeah, okay. Um, consider this little movie a preview which demonstrates one way in which we've approached telling stories with maps. In this case, extracted um, from three particular data sets, the gridded population of the world produced at Columbia by scientists at Season, and the day and night view of Earth uh, produced by NASA's Suomi satellites. The work was shown at the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2018. Dimensions of Citizenship, uh, the show was called Dimensions of Citizenship, began from the premise that it is important for architects and designers to envision what it means to be a citizen and how might architecture then express and engage with today's paradoxical conditions of citizenship. Each artist group was given a different scale at which to work. Citizen, civitas, region, nation, globe, network, and cosmos. Our assignment was the global scale. Um. The first time the whole, we saw the whole Earth from space was in 1972. The blue marble presented our planet as a fragile living organism floating in a lifeless void. To this view of Earth, free of national borders, captured the idea of a global humanity and a common stewardship. The first time we saw the Earth at night uh, was in 2009. The black marble presented the extent of the human footprint on the planet and a reassuring image of so-called connectedness. Light suggests concentrations of populations in cities and town. The brightest lights are mega regions of capital and power. Is it going? Yeah. 
I'm showing you this not to say very much about it, but just to show you how we transitioned um, the storytelling devices in, in the gallery. So this was unpeeling a globe into a specific projection. And then it kept going from there. So our next, yeah, had great sound too, Bobby Pietrasco. <laughs> um, our narrative work began with a hunch. In this highly processed, cloudless, nighttime view of Earth, light has become a proxy for connectedness of the human footprint on Earth, of settlement and economic activity, of the Anthropocene, or whatever else you would like to call it. When I look at this image, I see only the gaps. And the hunch was that the absence of light did not always mean the absence of people, and its converse, the presence of light did not always mean the presence of people. Indeed, I will show dark yet populated spaces are dispersed across the globe. Light and un unpopulated spaces abound as well. To do this work, we deployed a second image set. The gridded population of the world shows the uneven ways in which governments count people. But the unevenness in data aside, we designed a method by which to subtract one data set from another. Our methodology resulted in 16,000 points. And from there, we started filtering the data to come up with global categories. Yellow shows the places in the world with lights and no people, and blue shows the places in the world with people and no lights. Our project began to become how to filter these 16,000 points to tell stories. Pad patterns emerged, and we were able to create categories. And this is not AI, by the way. <laughs> so has nothing to do with what Kate was talking about this morning. Um, so for example, the places um, in the world where the absence of light does not mean the absence of people are wealthy, wealthy enclaves where they switch off the nights, lights at night, some refugee camps, this is an obvious one, they are not counted in any census, outages due to war and hurricanes, Aleppo is pictured here, and the data is from 2016, the height of the war of that war. Cities denied light, North Korea, Haiti, Puerto Rico are in that same category as well. Extraction settlements where migrant workers live um, and are not counted. Informal settlements, um, which is to say sometimes called slums, and indigenous territories. Um, so these are these eight categories as they are seen in the NASA. Oh, the images are really not showing, okay. And this is the, the daytime view of those pixels. So, right, it looks, the black means zero count of the population, and there you can see, I mean, zero light, and you can see in those images uh, evidence of quite large cities. Um, so shown here that the stories are common around the world, um, we then move from that to 128 such conditions um, you know, that demonstrate that. So, so the project then moved from abstract spatial concepts to specific stories, zooming in on kinds of places in the world where the presence of light does not mean the presence of people. What's happening? Okay. Huh? It just kind of, yeah. So the kinds of places where there are lights and no people are industrial farms, natural gas extraction, power plants, military bases, ports, borders, tourism sites, and strip mines. We focused on three locations um, to tell uh, specific stories. Um, a strip mine, a tourism site, and a natural gas extraction site. 
Um, the strip mine was in the Republic of the Congo, and I'm going to show you that story in detail. Tourism, where people are not counted, but huge, huge amounts of electricity, often not from national uh, uh, governments, is the Dominican Republic. And in Peru, we were focusing on natural gas extraction, otherwise known as fracking, mostly um, in indigenous territories. Um, so I'm only going to have time to show you one of these stories. Oops. Is it playing? Oh. Okay, so the, key, the KOV mine is a copper mine in the south of the Democratic Republic of Congo and is operated by Glencore, an Anglo-Swiss mining company. A high voltage power line supplies electricity for the Kav mine from the Inga Dams, 1700 kilometers to the west. So you can see that line. Cities, villages, and town along the pathway of this power line cannot draw power from it. Okay, and so now we're zooming in on those eight towns and showing them what they, what they look like on the night lights, which is that they have no light. And then the daytime view of those same uh, pixels, so-called pixels, are the low resolution pixels on the Suomi satellite, which shows indeed they are quite big cities even. Right, so this is about how government is prioritizing sending water and el electricity to the mine rather than enabling electricity in these places. And then we generalize from that to the 200 Glencore sites around the world, which are in very same situations to nearby cities. Okay. So since um, we were in the U.S. pavilion, um, we decided to end on a U.S. map and the story and, and story and be able to show the way in which daily, in which the daily nightlights imagery can also show change over time because this image is produced once every day at 1 a.m. in the morning. So even where electricity is ubiquitous, which is in the United States, um, power remains unequally distributed. The United States has a so-called 100% access to electricity, but not all people are treated equally after electricity is disrupted. Within 30 days of, of one another, hurricanes of equal magnitude hit the city of Houston and the US territory of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, as we know, remains subject to frequent power outages and, the isle and island wild blackouts, while Houston recovered its electricity very few days later.
Okay. So again, this is just the way. It was very large, immersive installation, and people were just sort of standing around watching. Okay, um, so I'm going to move very abruptly to another project, and it's again in response to some things that were said yesterday asking for some analysis of uh, Chinese social media, which is something we did in 2012, so it's a little old now, it's about Weibo, and as we know, China um, is mostly using WeChat now, which is harbinger maybe for our own future, so social media platforms can replace each other. Um, so it is a, it's a project we've called Jumping the Great Firewall. And although the dominant social, um, this, no, sorry, um, we all know that there is a severe regime of censorship in China, particularly in online spaces. Using data gleaned from a website called Sino Weibo, which is analogous to Twitter worldwide, we visualized the ways in which Chinese citizens, from ordinary people to journalists and lawyers, were actively evading and overcoming state restrictions on expression, often with great creativity. How did they do this? Much of Chinese censorship is automated. Text is relatively easy to analyze with computation on a massive scale. And so the regime can keep, it, keep watch on, remove language as it, become, as it deems dangerous very efficiently. Images, on the other hand, are much more difficult to an analyze computationally. Chinese Weibo users have understood this and exploited it in powerful ways. When they have something edgy to say, they post their messages not as text but as photographs of a text, effectively preventing them from being read by machines. Ultimately, their authorities find them by eye and hand, of course, but the ideas and messages have already been able to be seen and spread. So this is one of these long uh, Weibo messages, which is actually a photograph of a text, which has been uh, shown on the, okay. So this happens um, on a massive scale, and we were interested in showing the how, when, why, and where, and what subject matter this clever trick was being used for. Since we knew what we were looking for, we began by collecting or scraping data in the form of hundreds of images from a discrete sample of 100 people who we knew were being censored. Um, 100 civic ac activists, mostly journalists or lawyers, with over 2,000 followers. We then watched these people's Weibo feeds to see what would happen when they posted images, what they were talking about, how they, did, how they spread, and how long they survived. We automatically downloaded all their posted images from Weibo and then checked back every 15 seconds to see whether the message was still there. To visualize this phenomenon, we created an interface for exploring the images we collected and tracking their fates. We wanted to dramatize both the restrictive nature of this Chinese government policy and the proactive creativity of Chinese citizens to make visible what the taboo topics were and what people were saying about them. We were also interested in how the messages spread, how they were copied, retreated, and as it were, multiplied. We created a timeline graphic which curated the deleted posts in a way that allowed us to see which images got retweeted most frequently, how long they survived, and what their subject matter was. So the short fat arrow here um, shows us that the posted image was retweeted many times and deleted in a short amount of time. The longer arrow, allows a smaller number of retweets and a longer time taken for the post to be deleted. If you were online, you'd be able to scroll through the graph and find out what the most dynamic images, the ones that spread, were removed most quickly, were all posted in that time, by the, that time period by that person. Um, so then, in collaboration with the online investigative journalist team at ProPublica, including one of the journalism students that was on our own team, we translated a two-week sample of 500 images and found that the topics of the image messages could be organized into 10 general categories. 
between July 24th and August uh, 4th, 2013, we collected a total of 7,972 posts, of which 1,710 had been deleted. Of the deleted posts, we found at least 557 that were removed by censors. In these postings, and remember that we were tracking 10 people we already knew were activists of one sort or another, the most prevalent categories of censored postings are what we called political speech and long form texts, i.e. those, you know, the ones that go beyond 140 characters. Um, way be uh, yeah. So you can see here that in a two week sample from 100 people we tracked, we found that 24% of the posts were long Weibo texts. Um, and 136 posts were about Bo Shilai. Um, we know that the images spread widely, but we didn't know, though, that because in this project we only tracked our sample of one sa our sample of dissidents about the fates of the retweeted messages as they spread. I think it's safe to assume, though, that these messages are still were still and may, might still be frustrating um, the censors. So from this, we drew a number of conclusions at the time, right? Um, first, we just conf confirmed that this practice exists and it is widespread and effective. Second, we mapped the topics and the flow of dissident communication and highlighted both censorship regime and the efforts to circumvent it. And third, we drew an ironic lesson that censorship does not simply make information disappear, it leaves traces and produces effects and can itself become a source of information. The censors effectively map themselves and just left it to us to draw out the details. And I think that somewhat relates to um, what Helen will talk about in relation to um, obfuscation. How many more minutes? Seven minutes left. Okay, I'm not sure which project to show quickly then. Um, this is Conflict Urbanism Columbia, um, where we drew on one specific database which was collected by the government called the Victims Registry to uh, collect information about what happened to them, what crimes were inflicted upon them, where they moved from and to, what their house looked like bef you know, before they were displaced. Um, with a view towards reparations. And what we did was we took this incredibly, you know, in some ways uncertain, um, incomplete um, database, and we wanted to use it to show um, rural, rural urban migration or migration, internal migration in a very specific way because you so often hear about internal migration or you hear about statistics about rural urban migration without being able to be very specific about it. So this is one of the inadvertent uh, ways in which you can use this incredibly uh, rich data set. And so I'm just gonna quickly scroll through it. Um, but you can really see the patterns of the war in the early 80s. They were up in the north by the, uh, those coastal cities and then uh, migration and violence spread across the whole country. Um, and then in the late 2000s, it sort of moved to the southwest. And then we zoomed in from some very, on some very specific events. Um, all of this you can look at on our, on our website. Um, we've also done a project about Aleppo, which I'm not going to go into any uh, detail about it all. We made an interactive map which you could browse by neighborhood. Um, it's on OpenStreetMaps. It doesn't use Google Earth at all. It use, uh, we purchased our own satellite imagery so you could be very specific um, about which images were being used. What I'm most proud about is this YouTube map that we made. Because we had a neighborhood map of Aleppo, the YouTube video happened to be meta have metadata about the specific neighborhoods, which were clearly the same neighborhoods as ours. And so we've um, pictured there three what we thought reliable activist YouTube um, networks and have geolocated them by neighborhood. So many journalists have told us that they've used um, our map um, to tell specific stories. 
Uh, the project that perhaps we're most well known um, for, and I want to conclude um, not with it, but with another project, um, which I have never shown and I really want to show today. So this is the Million Dollar Blocks project, which is about the disproportionate effects of incarceration on neighborhoods of color across the, the United States. So this is the lines which connect the home addresses of people in Brooklyn to where they are housed upstate New York. Mostly money is sent to rural white um, towns, uh, propping up their economies, which you know have been neglected to uh, production of things uh, in China and elsewhere in the world. Um, and I'm going to end here. And if you let me just quickly read this. Um, so this is actually from 2015, uh, during the State of the Union address by um, Obama, where Nicholas Belmonte and Simon Rogers wanted to track conversation on Twitter as it was influenced by the president's speech. And they wanted to, the analysis to be ready within hours of the president's speech ending. They did just this. Um, and you can see over here, you can scroll across it, and it's called a steam graph to explore both the analysis of the content of the speech and the trends in Twitter, in the Twitter conversation around it. The intent of the visual is to show how these two things correspond to one another. Uh, for example, this particular thing that's highlighted, it shows at 22.22 o'clock in his spade of a union address, Obama said, we may have very different takes on the events of Ferguson and New York, but surely we can understand a father who fears his son can't walk home without being harassed. Surely we can understand the wife who won't rest until the police officer she married walks through the front door at the end of his shift. Surely we can agree it's a good thing that for the first time in 40 years, the crime rate and the incarceration rate have come down together and use that as a starting point for Democrats and Republicans, community leaders and law enforcement to reform America's criminal justice system so that it protects and serves us all, unquote. He is moderate and centrist as always, reminding us of the dangers of kids of color in their own neighborhoods and cities, and also he reminds us that the lives of the police can be dangerous as well. And it's true, crime and incarceration did decrease during the Obama era but not always at the same rates in cities, across the in cities across the United States. What is not mentioned in Obama's speech and not mentioned in general is that the numbers of incarcerated people are disproportionate to a general urban population in any city in the United States. Incarcerated people, um, so that, those were the maps that I, that I showed you before. So during this period, um, in preparation for an event at Columbia about space, race, and justice, we collected Twitter data around the hashtag at Black Lives Matter and at I Can Breathe to see whether we could find spatial patterns in the protests that in the protests and organization in locations in which people were tweeting about these hashtags or about the topology of networks around retweeting. What has emerged, however, is that we can make another connection for the designers, that the designers of that steam graph uh, obfuscated, a conversation by people using the hashtags at Black Lives Matter and at I Can't Breathe, and about a conversation that likely would have not shown up in their trend analysis. Rather than plot trends, we wanted people to read the contents of the tweet, and we have therefore organized them in a concordance around a few keywords. Um, this one that you just saw was address, um, black, police, justice, for example, making it easy to read the sentiment in the tweets. First, the expectation that Obama would focus on this important topic, as well as respond to the public outrage that the police were not indicted and the disappointment about the absence of this topic in his speech. And just in case you couldn't read them, I wanted to just highlight a few of these. Um, there will be mention, will there be mention of justice for all, Black Lives Matter? On the one hand, first, at so to call for criminal justice reform, blah, blah, blah. Um, extremely disappointed, there was no mention of Black Lives Matter, food, justice, animal rights, etc. Time up. <laughs> I think that did it. Thank you.